As we began, uh, we continue in the structure of Buddhism, still in the Theravada realm. And uh, I would like to talk about the three insights. Insight into impermanence, insight into impurity, and insight into non-self. Okay? Why is this so important? Because even if you're not a practitioner, you meet all these three qualities in your life. And you respond to these qualities differently. So, insight into impermanence. What does that really mean? Okay. I tell you a little story. Many of you know the mustard seed story. But some of you may not. So, a woman who had a child. And the child was born late in the woman's life. Lost her child. And uh, she was very, very deeply sad. And she went to the Buddha with the dead child in her arm and said, Buddha, I know you have special power. Please resurrect my child. I cannot have any more this lifetime. And I loved her very, very much. And the Buddha says, okay, I'll try. I can do that if you bring me a special ointment. This has to come from mustard seeds. These mustard seeds must come from a family house or any family house where there was no death. If you bring me this ointment, I can resurrect your child. And as you know, right away, this brings some very deep realization of impermanence. So the woman, because she had faith, she started to go around, around, and she was asking families and went from house to house, and everywhere they said, we are very sorry. In this house, there was also death. We cannot give you that special mustard seed because we are not like that. So she goes and receives the same answer over and over and over again. And then after, she realizes, oh, we cannot turn impermanence back. We cannot turn back the wheel of time. It's impossible. So, this was a very important teaching by the Buddha. There may be very powerful people who can resurrect another person, you know, who can do miracles for many, many, many times. Still, impermanence does not stop. Still, this body has to die. So, this is a very important teaching by the Buddha because if we do not accept impermanence, we cannot function clearly as human beings. Okay? So when you start your practice, you may want something special. That I will be different. I will not die. Well, I will die very differently. Okay? Sometimes with some big miracle. Okay? But that's not the way it goes. In fact, it's a very, very small use of the Dharma. Okay? Wanting to use it this way. And impermanence is something that we have to come to terms with ever since we're born. When we are separated from our parents as infants, we all cry. We depend on them. So we taste a little bit of impermanence. When somebody dies in the family, we also taste that. But it's very strange that human beings do not realize that they themselves are subject to the same law of impermanence all the time. They will die in the same way as their grandf grandparents. Because when it happens, it just doesn't dawn on people. But for a very sensitive and gifted and powerful individual like Shakyamuni Buddha, it did. Because this truth was hidden from him for a long time. 
And when he realized that, at a more mature age, he asked his cart driver, Chunda, Chunda, is it true that kings also die? Yes, your majesty, kings also die. Then I have no use for this kingdom. If death also catches me, why keep that? It cannot save me. It cannot help me. So realizing impermanence made him go and seek something which is beyond life and death. Because there's something really interesting. As you observe forms and thoughts coming and going, that which observes doesn't move. It's like a mirror, okay? So when you start practicing meditation, many, many thoughts appear in your mind. You can let go of them. Then these thoughts disappear. Outside in life, many forms appear. One, two, three, many, many forms, okay? They all come and they go. You go to the shop, buy them, use them, throw them away. Then they get recycled and come back in a new form, in a new product. Okay? So this is impermanence or the cycle of life and death. Nothing is exempt from this. That's why we call the Dharma the universal law because it has no exceptions. The truth of the Dharma as it is expounded is universal. And that's why it's valid and will be valid everywhere in this universe where we have form, where we have body, we have mind, where beings exist in the way we do. So impermanence is very, very important and don't be afraid of it. Use impermanence, okay? Because if suffering is also impermanent, then you can get enlightenment. Then you can attain liberation. So impermanence, not good, not bad. But if you are attached to your desire, then impermanence is big suffering. Okay? This is very, very important. So do not look at impermanence as a, the big hunter, which will hunt you down. You were born. So the moment you wake up to the fact that everything is impermanent, you know you will die. So this body can go away. But what is it that sees impermanence? What is it that perceives coming and going? That's very important. Because if you attain that, then you are liberated. That's why the Buddha practiced. That's what he attained. That's what we follow to attain that mind which he attained. So if we can do that, then we are free from life and death. Still the body has to die. But if you're not identifying with the body, then your death, much less suffering. It doesn't cause so much suffering. Okay? So, impermanence is just the way names and forms exist. But when I said previously that human beings and all sentient beings have Buddha nature, that means that you can perceive this impermanence. And when you perceive that, you can use that. If you don't perceive that, then this impermanent world uses you. And remember, we talked about the mind creating this world. So if your mind creates this world, how come that this world can use you, can overrule you? And the answer is because of blindness. And the Buddha called this avidya, or not seeing, not awakening. Because of this not awakened mind, because of this unclear mind, what we created can control us. You can see it increasingly out there. And the Buddha's teaching is that it doesn't have to be that way. Okay? We can wake up. We can see how we create things. And we can turn the processes around. We can set new direction. And we can follow that. Okay? Impurity is also very interesting because... Um, we, from our early childhood, distinguish pleasant, unpleasant, like, dislike, okay? And when you see that all these distinctions are created by your mind alone, then you see that these distinctions are empty. We make them. For instance, when uh, you go to a different culture, you eat different kind of food, okay? So for you, the inside of a coconut 
may be very strange, but for somebody who was born in Malaysia, the inside of, of a coconut, this white, you know, little slimy thing, is very, very delicious. And if you get used to it, that means you put down your like and dislike mind, for you it will be delicious too. I experienced that. And you can experience that also when you go to other countries. Like Korean people, they go to the West, they order some food, and they eat and say, oh, mashiopta, mashiopta, no spice. So then they use lots of gochichang, lots of salt, and then they, they have the mat, they have the taste they want, okay? So that means conditioned existence and having certain types of like and dislike mind. And ultimately, it can lead to a notion of impurity, that something is pure, something is impure, something is suitable, something unsuitable, etc. Okay? So that's a very interesting notion, but it's all conditioned. You know, they all don't exist by themselves. I have seen with my own eyes that in a little children, children's cart, there was a child like two years old, and the mummy was putting a little kimchi and a little rice into the mouth. And the child, oh, wonderful. Eat. Okay? But if you do that to a Western kid, just overnight, be crying. Wow! Strong taste, strong taste. Okay? So, very different. Okay? And non-self, you know, the third subject for our, you know, Dharma talk is also very interesting. This is something very, very fundamental. What does that mean? Uh, it means that phenomena, things, do not exist with an independent soul, an independent entity, okay? They are put together from ingredients or parts. And when you take away these parts, then this form disappears without a trace. Okay? This is a very important point because without that, we could not attain liberation also. So, if you have a watch like this, you can take it apart and you see that it has a belt, it has a dial, it has some circuitry inside. And there is no watch soul or watch ego inside which says, don't take me apart, I'm a watch. Okay? So the tree doesn't say, I'm a tree. The watch doesn't say, I'm a watch. When it was put together, it didn't start moving and say, hello, I'm here, I'm your new watch. How can I make you happy today? So it, it didn't happen like that. Okay? So the whole universe, including you, exists like that. So that's why we say, making this I is a mistake because it is illusion. Okay? In the Heart Sutra it says, Human beings, form, so body, feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness. Okay? That's our component. There is no I there. And when you see that, as Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva sees that, perceives that, that is transcending all distress and suffering. That originally, no I, no self. So, non-self is sometimes frightening for many Westerners or any kind of beginner practitioners because they say, what will happen to me, you know? If I have no self, I will disappear. Of course, you will disappear, but you will feel much better without your own ego, okay? Much, much better. First, little vulnerable, but after that, you get used to this, you know, direct feeling, directness of the world, directness of other people, because no wall, no roles, no games, then much, much better. That's not a promise, okay? So, after the introduction, I welcome any questions you may have. You talked about impermanence and impurity and all this suffering and all this changing. Uh, yet, when you talked about Buddha nature, Buddha nature is something we describe as something realized or permanent or or, you know, the word perfect or something. How come all these sufferings and impermanence came about? Uh, if you say Buddha nature is permanent, it's a mistake. If you say it is impermanent, also a mistake. 
Originally, Buddha nature has no name, no form. Therefore, no attributes also. And if you look at Zen history, many times when Buddha nature had too many attributes, people talked about it too much, then, had to be, then there had to be a Zen master which cut all that thinking. So Buddha nature has no thinking, no words, no speech, no concepts. So why do we use Buddha nature as a name, as a concept, you may ask? Reason, teaching, word. It's a teaching method. So that your intellect first can have a foothold. But when we also teach that Buddha nature is originally empty or does not exist, this foothold is gone. But first, a child needs to learn how to walk, then how to run, then how to jump, then how to ride the bicycle. Okay? It all takes time. So for the intellect, for the thinking, to have a concept is very important. It can focus around it. But Buddha nature originally doesn't exist. So when they asked Joju Zen Master a long time ago, does a dog have Buddha nature? He says, Mu! She says, no. Okay? He had to say that because everybody was talking about Buddha nature. Buddha nature is like this. Buddha nature is like that. All kinds of speech. All incorrect. Okay? Too much thinking. So, Buddha nature originally without thinking. Only this point. Because when you hear the sound, there's no thinking in your mind. That's what we say, we call Buddha nature. But it's only a teaching word. Okay? So if you ask a tree, do you have Buddha nature? What will the tree do? Just continue bowing in the wind. That's all. Okay? You ask a child, do you have Buddha nature? They say, oh. They don't understand that. So for students of the path, we create many, many skillful means or teaching methods. And that's one of them. It works really well. Because when you attain that Buddha nature originally is empty or does not exist, that's very, very mature. That means liberation from even the concept of Buddhahood. That's very good. Okay. Does this answer so your question? When you know the, in Zen, uh, the Kongan, Yes. And the, you know, there's a famous story about this uh, Buddha nature, this disciple asked Joju. Yeah. Uh, when a dog pass, was passing, whether the dog has a Buddha nature or not. Exactly. And says, yeah. And, but says, was told that everything has Buddha nature. Yeah. But if everything has Buddha nature, then nothing has Buddha nature. Okay? It's the same. So, it's used for your mind to have an initial foothold. Because if people are faced right away that nothing exists by itself, nothing has a self, then what does the mind do? It gets, as we heard you know, last time, disappointed. Because this mind wants something, wants enlightenment, wants liberation, okay? Wants nirvana. And when it's taken away because everything is illusion, then big disappointment, big depression, sometimes nihilism comes. So, slowly, slowly, okay? If the surgeon is very good, then the operation is not too quick, just step by step, okay? Too quick operation may be a masterpiece, but patient dies, okay? So, that's why when we teach, we start from where people's consciousness is. And people really sincerely, practitioners, they want something. They want to attain enlightenment, want to attain liberation. So we create this Buddha nature concept. You know? And then when you get mature, this is, oh, Buddha nature also created. It's also a name. Okay? It's also some kind of help. But when you become an adult and a ma mature practitioner, you see originally nothing. Originally, nothing like that, okay? Only before thinking. And if you don't think, how come Buddha nature can arise in your mind? Okay? Good. More questions? You said 
Somebody say, I don't want anything and I don't attach it anything, but still uh, they have I. Then just I'd like to know what is the difference between some people and someone who say, I don't want anything and um, someone who got uh, freedom and really liberality. Okay, so those who are truly free, you know, for them, getting something or not getting something, okay. Those who are really attached to some kind of idea, they say, I don't want anything. I don't want, the strong I, okay. I don't want anything means really want something. What kind? You decide. <laughs> if you want something, okay. But if you say, I don't want anything, same kind of mind, except that it's empty, it has no content, just rejection. If you're truly free, then getting a glass of milk, okay. Not getting a glass of milk, also okay. That's original freedom, okay. So many, many practitioners, they say, I want to be reborn like this. I want to go to this country next slide. This kind of mind appears. That's not liberation mind. That's good deal mind, okay. It's very different. So, if people want something good for themselves, soon, very soon, turns over, becomes attachment and suffering. Like the most wonderful and col colorful coat which burns on them. Take them on, take the coat on, fasten the buttons, and the next moment it's on flames, burning on you. So that's why, be careful what you want. Why? Because you get it. And if you get it, it's yours. If you identify with it, then you make mistake. That's why not wanting anything, or as you said, I want nothing, very strong I. Okay? Very strong I. Okay. So I suggest that when you practice, keep your mind 100% open and clear not attached to anything. And when you're not attached to anything, then whatever appears in your mind, no problem. Even if you see the most horrible karma, no problem. Because you don't attach to it, you don't identify with it, you don't check it, don't judge it, don't hold it. Okay? That's correct practice. Also, if nothing appears in your mind, you don't become afraid. You just sit in there. Okay? And you use that clarity. So, thank you for your attention, and we continue with the next episode soon. Thank you. This program is a program of the Jandong Wheelchair Jandong Scooter Jamun Office, JS Home Shopping Company.